Never respond to a kid of 35. He's like a grandson. During that time, about 20 years ago, every decision maker was about 65 to 75. But during the last 10 years or there about, they adopted this practice called 8060, meaning born around the 80s, but graduated 10 years later. Uh, sorry, the other way around. Born around the 60s, graduated around the 80s, meaning they're about 35 to 40 years. If you go to China now, most of them are of around 40, and they make big decisions. And by the way, most of them are very fluent in English. Fluent. When I was in the Shanghai Museum, I met a girl, and she approached me and spoke to me in proficient English. When I went back to the hotel, I thought about this, and it, it scared me like hell, you know. Because it is a policy of the Chinese government to make sure that every seven-year-old upward must study English. Can you imagine if 10% of them are proficient in English? You're talking about 13, 10% of... Uh, no, no. 10 per, 130 million Chinese per year learn English. So in a couple of years, the population of people who can speak English will exceed the population of the United States. And it's a frightening thought because they know how to use English. That means they have access to technology and science. So it's, a, it's, it's very important. Recently, they have introduced what is called 211 and uh, 985. 211 means 21st century and 100 universities. They have identified 100 universities. And now of the 100, 10 will be the best in the world. And each one is given 1 billion ringgit for research. 1 billion ringgit per university. That's the type of scale they're going in. So it's a very frightening thing because this is a juggernaut. It's a state capitalism. And they're doing it also in industry. When we first really linked up with China, we realized that they were already at that time identifying 33 national champions that I alluded to. I didn't put the number there, 33. They identified, uh, identified higher one of them and benchmark against the equivalent of uh, the whirlpools and the um, um, what do you call this? Um, see, I also forgotten the American name. I think I can think higher. You see how much impact it has already. Gen no, it's related. Appliances. Appliances, yeah. Um, Electrolux. Electrolux. Uh, uh, yeah, some of the older names. At that time, you know, they want to be as good as. So I'm, uh, yeah, they, no, there's one more. Uh, Cabinators. You know, yeah, they, uh, on white white goods, for example. Yeah, higher and white goods. And there were 33 of such companies identified throughout China. Can you imagine this process of identifying? Obviously, they've already had their own semi-finals kind of thing. And no, I mean, they probably don't just random pick. They probably analyze the potential of the management and so on, what they can do to restructure, how much they can give in terms of investment facilities and so on, and research R&D and, and automotive in engineering, as I mentioned just now. And that's how we knew that they were not just about to open up and welcome you. That they do. And I think that's because the world demands liberalization because they are going global. And on the side, they are doing this because they know once they liberalize, there'll be competition. They must get ready for competition when it comes in and also on the converse, to be ready to enter the global market. And that something was what we alerted the, the Malaysian private sector about this the identification of companies, as they did in the education sector, and they have done it in many other sectors. Thank you. A well, um, couple of observations following Paul and uh, their comments. Um, to understand the differences between China and India, I realized one day it's the same as difference between a Christian wedding and a Hindu wedding. Uh, Christian wedding is everything planned out. 
and you cannot deviate from the script. Everything happens exactly the time when, you know, the priest shows up properly, the bride knows what to say, bridegroom knows what to say, and it's a very somber event. And after the wedding is over, there's a sigh of relief that everything worked out well and that they celebrate, right? Uh, China is very much like that, very precise. So you need to understand that you can't deviate from things that they've already planned out if you try to do that. If you have attended a Hindu wedding, an Indian wedding, you know that Indian wedding, when it begins, when it ends, who cares? You know, yeah, it believes in reincarnation, so, you know. <laughs> you know, I attended my grandniece's wedding four years ago in a city called Baroda. In the middle of the wedding, the priest got a cell phone call. And he took it. I'm getting upset. My nephew, whose daughter was getting married, he said, look, you have forgotten your roots. This is India, okay? And that style makes a difference. Are you able to adapt to one style or the other depending upon the culture and the context is very key. Also, it seems like the Chinese, before they invite you for anything, have done significant homework on you. Okay, like the Japanese, exactly. In India, they don't even know you. You're welcome, that's fine. So proper introductions are very important as to who you are. They have their own stereotypes about other countries, other companies, etc. Very key. I wanted to slightly digress that despite all this, there are lots of similarities. You know, the Guangxi principle in China <coughs> is equally appropriate in India, surprisingly. There is sort of an expectation that if I ask you for a favor, that you will return a favor to me. And the five silent languages are pretty much the same. Friendship does matter. Very important that you know each other, you can trust each other, and friendship does matter. The notion of time is very different between the two. As I said, one is eternal, the other one is uh, how can I get it done. Uh, the third one is uh, notion of space is different between the two, the spatial aspects. Uh, agreement. And neither country really believes in uh, the letter of law. Even though you sign those things, uh, it is really more like what we have agreed to do as opposed to what the legal work tells us to do. Both are reforming now to be part of the global economy. Both are trying to make sure that the Western contractual approaches, a tort law, will be important. That's very fascinating also to find. So what I'm saying is that I think both markets are equally important. As Paul said, you need to contextualize, uh, not just country, region, but the individual you are dealing with. Uh, I'll give you my experience. Um, China is clearly going after software services now, not just the hardware. And in the Shanghai region alone, there are six software parks, each one with about 200 to 240 companies. And they invited me to start a training company because they really admire the Indian training companies that have come, which has generated a lot of software called NIIT and Aptech. And they dominate China. They wanted to create their own internal training company uh, with a professor who is absolutely an icon. And all of the bureaucrats are trained by him in this area. So through his uh, connections, I was invited to see if I would be a venture capital. In other words, I would put my money behind. And I met again, as you say, the party chief, especially a regional or a provincial party chief, is the most critical person. Ultimately, you end up meeting with him and have a uh, lunch. In my case, it was a lunch. He did not speak English. So now I have to manage about body language of what he's trying to tell, what you are trying to tell. And interesting, at the end of I said, yeah, here is my money. I'm very passionate. We can do this training, etc. I looked at the facilities. And two months later, I got a message uh, that we don't need you anymore. You know, it was interesting. It was fascinating. I still haven't figured out why not, OK? <laughs> it was very fascinating. So those are the things that you put up with, pretty much. So, so. Uh, but both markets are very critical, I must tell you. Uh, I think despite all the difficulties, and as Paul mentioned, it takes like 10 years, 
I think persistence pays off, building relationships and bridges pay off. Uh, tea ceremony in Japan is more important, surprisingly, in both nations. Uh, inviting them over here is equally important that rather than just us going there. I think this nation has so many things to offer that unless somebody visits Malaysia, you cannot get an emotional feeling of how good this nation is. Yeah. Uh, it's a remarkable. I mean, uh, people like us who come here get totally impressed. Infrastructure is there. This morning I was telling someone, this is a very clean city. You know, images may not be there, but it's quite clean relative to other cities. I mean, those are very important. So inviting them here, showcasing things, are very important. It's all experiential as opposed to, as you said, you know, just uh, talk or, you know, books or something like that. But it's just very possible. I would say, please do not underestimate, as I think what you mentioned, uh, this is the big event taking place where the East Asia uh, architecture will surpass the European Union and it will be the largest trading block very, very soon. And if China is orchestrating I must tell you, I flew in from India. I was in Delhi two, three days ago, and the message I got was that Indian government now has strongly encouraged all of the Indian high commissioners and ambassadors in the ASEAN geography to become more and more trade missionaries. So now you will see a little more proactive approach by the high commissioner to approach the Malaysian industry, okay? It seems like China and India both would like to just like they're doing in Africa, equalize with each other to equally show uh, the presence and engagement with Malaysia. Thank you. May, may I ask a question myself here? Uh, bearing in mind that now there has been changes in the profile of management of business, uh, management of bureaucracies, both in India and China, uh, um, uh, most significantly in China, because the youngsters have come up. I call them youngsters because they're probably out my children's age. Uh, would, not be, would it be correct to say that some of those problems of yesteryear would already ease off? And we are now in, going to interface with a young generation of managers, of entrepreneurs, uh, who understand much of uh, Chinese values, but also global values. Uh, the way Americans do business, Europeans do business. So in other words, we can be more comfortable now. I was trying, I'm not trying to frighten you that you're too late to enter China or India. I was just making a point that it's too late to discuss which areas you should enter. But coming in now, I think you have a better time, an easier time, because you're going to talk the same uh, level, uh, along the same de common denominators. Uh, that thing, I, I feel that. Because when I went to China, I was interfacing again uh, with the 60, 70 year olds. Uh, they were quite my contemporaries, so it's quite comfortable for me, but not necessarily with the people I brought. Now, the young entrepreneurs of today, from Malaysia and everywhere, I think can be more comfortable. It will e be easier to undertake negotiations without having the excess baggage of the old cultural um, values and norms that were constraining before. Would you say that, Professor? Oh, uh, and especially China, Paul's comment is very true. This, this new generation of young people all have Western experiences. They know everything about the way the Western cultures, the uh, theories, the ideas, etc. They have traveled. China has a national policy besides English to make sure Chinese become the largest tourist in the world so that they understand as they have traveled as tourists how different cultures uh, behave in many ways. So it's a very fascinating thing. And by the way, the same thing is happening with India. India always had a Western understanding quite a lot, but the next generation of family businesses, they send their young children to study, for example, in uh, either UK or in America, Australia to a large extent, and to some extent Singapore now. But very interestingly, when they come back, they're taking over family businesses and they're far more advanced in their thinking. They're much more contemporary. So dealing with them, just as you said, I think it's a lot easier today than ever before. Unless again, if there is one family member, 70 years old, still controlling you know, the destiny of the, of, the, of the business group, then it's a different matter, but generally, you will find that, uh, that it's much, much easier today than ever before. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nod, I have a question for you. Uh, Dr. Sheth has been mentioning two things. Uh, this morning also he said 
Malaysia seems to have all the ingredients, but the recipe somewhere is missing. In order to communicate to the rest of the world, yes, great effort has been made by the government in aligning everything for us. Businesses need to prepare. That the question is, what do we need to do collectively or individually as a corporation to be able to piggyback on this great rise? How do we take advantage of the great rise that is taking place? I think uh, many of the speakers have highlighted about the peculiarities of both India and China. So you need to understand the peculiarities. And that's the reason why some, many companies are uh, rather reluctant to go there. It requires this additional effort of going there, understanding, or even bringing them here. And they feel more comfortable doing business domestically and uh, within the region. Although we don't speak the same language within ASEAN, but there is this notion that our culture is the same, uh, you know, we, our values are similar, so they feel more comfortable. And, uh, but there are those companies that have taken the jump, the leap that uh, Tansri has mentioned. Uh, during the uh, 97 crisis, for example, many of our construction companies, they, they do not have any job in the country. So they don't have a choice to survive but to find opportunities overseas. And they went to India. Many of them went to India because India was in the, at, at that stage was in, in the course of developing a lot of infrastructure. And they get involved, and many, many of them got their fingers burned. Uh, but many of them, but those experiences made them more confident about doing business overseas. And they start venturing uh, into other markets, for example, the Middle East, for example. So the, in other words, uh, going back to what you said this morning, is the crisis that, that forces them to take those risks. But you know, before that, the comfort of having a growing economy uh, kind of uh, doesn't encourage, doesn't provide them the impetus to go abroad. But having said that, there's still a lot of opportunities in China. Let me tell you, in Madrid, during uh, when, when China first opened up, uh, we were excited because you know there a lot of visitors from China coming to Madrid, and we were very happy. But now we feel that just too many of them coming, <laughs> just to show that the Chinese need us. You know, it's a question of, of us understanding what they really need and. There is a place for us. And uh, something we discussed this morning is that many of the businesses in China are being managed by Malaysian professionals. That alone shows that the Chinese recognize our capabilities. And, they won't, uh, and similarly in India, as I said, many infrastructure projects are being done by Malaysian companies, managed by Malaysian uh, professionals. So uh, knowing the, the capabilities of Malaysian is not an issue. It's just a question of us finding out where we are. But, of course, we don't, we don't go to China and India with a perceived uh, notion of what we want to do. You have to understand the market. Uh, that's the, the, the root of it all. Thanks. I think this morning or in the afternoon, Professor made a very good point. One of the most dangerous threats and enemies to ourselves is our own complacency. If you are an ordinary businessman, an average businessman, if you, if you work very hard, you can make one million in Malaysia. I, I'm very confident about that, if you work very hard. So, if our target is just one million, it's not difficult. Some hawkers make more than that per year. But if you are a Singaporean, you have no chance to do it. And that's why there are more successful Singapore companies in China, because they don't have a hinterland nor a domestic base. See, like some of my, uh, shall we say, uh, rival colleges and so on, they're all in China. Because the domestic market for education is very small. In China itself, these people are very entrepreneurial. Let me give you two examples. There's this company that teaches nothing but English. And they're not natives, you know, they're Chinese. Chinese teaching English. It's called New Oriental, I think. And it's listed on Nasdaq. The market cap is close to 3 billion US dollars. Just teaching English. It's huge. So the scale is huge. Two nights ago, I watched CCTV9. Forget watching CNN. Just watch CCTV9, if you want to know China. And there was this gentleman who was recently affected by all the crises in the world. He was in the hardware business, and he was very tired, and he was about to sleep. 
and his daughter came along and gave him a toy, musical toy. You know. So he fell asleep because it's so soothing. Then he woke up next morning, he got a, an idea, a very simple idea. He woke up and said, I slept so soundly because of the music. Why don't I put this musical toy into the pillow? And now he is successfully exporting this pillow with the music, you know. So simple to the whole world. Great. Uh, any questions from the floor for, the, for any of the panel members, please? My name is Joseph, and this is addressed to the entire panel. Um, earlier, we were talking about Malaysia being at the heart of the three concentric circles of Asia. And I was wondering, besides being a geographical heart, I was wondering, from your individual perspectives, what sort of positioning could Malaysia take um, in the region, particularly when you consider that, let's say, Singapore is the financial center, or Indonesia is the growing uh, market because of its sheer numbers? So how can Malaysia as a nation and Malaysian companies effectively position themselves to compete? I'm just going to rephrase the question. How can Malaysia be the heart of Asia, both from a physical and a figurative point of view? So, Tanshi, first. Well, I never said the heart of Asia or anything. I was talking about being in the, in the nucleus of the three concentric circles, because not just geographical, but also because of the economic positioning, you know, we have the strategic linkages in terms of trade, uh, in terms of our networking overseas. Uh, that is a reality. But whether we optimize that is another question. Perhaps that's what you are alluding to. Uh, I would say yes and no, because in the past we have uh, set up the infrastructure to make sure that we can actually become a regional hub. And today, uh, as I recall, and from the latest statistics, we are indeed uh, bringing in investors and investments for people to set up regional office, international procurement centers here, international distribution centers, and operational headquarters in Malaysia in large numbers. Uh, and this is increasing. In other words, they do see us as being able to service that bigger, bigger region for their businesses. Yeah? And uh, to us, that is something uh, that we have been working towards. It can be improved, certainly, because the, the number of sectors that people can regionalize in uh, Malaysia uh, is not limited. It's up to the, uh, the people who are promoting this hub, whether it's ministries, agencies, to make sure that the physical infrastructure, the institutional support uh, does make people comfortable uh, placing their hub activities, so to speak, here in Malaysia. But so far, we are successful in that, although I see a lot more potential to be exploited. And for us, it's not just about marketing ourselves. Maybe it is also about uh, now marketing the success story so far about us being a hub. Uh, it's easy to say we want to be a hub. We have to understand that being a hub is not just being able to be distributing, be the point of reference and so on. Uh, being a hub also, you have to be uh, over and above the domestic standards. You, know, you have to be a regional hub means that you must focus and benchmark against the best in the world in other regions so that people can say, ah, uh, you know, if we were, we call Hong Kong a hub for financial centre, uh, like Singapore has become one, we want to be a financial hub. I mean, there's room for many hubs, but we can not, not just focus on what Singapore, Hong Kong is doing. We have made headway in uh, the Islamic uh, window, or, or Islamic aspects of banking and financial uh, sector. We can further build on that because we're the pioneers on it. And it doesn't mean we do it in isolation. We can still network with the Hong Kong and the Singapore entities to make that work for the region as a whole, with us becoming that new hub for that new pro uh, financial services product. So this is what uh, should be in mind when we talk about being a hub. Uh, and we cannot just be uh, you know, a hub for things that are quite normal now, you know, like for the manufacturing. To me, that is, we shouldn't be repeating that anymore. It's, it's already understood. We've already got that foundation. It's the new area, the services. Um, for example, India used to be very, um, uh, I mean, uh, attractive as call centers. Yeah? And then we, we said, why not? In the context of outsourcing, 
backroom operations. Malaysia can do that because we have the multilingual and multiracial talents that we can actually take in to service these centres, not for consumer electronics and so on, but for other things. So we had. Uh, we promoted that uh, 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 to, to the rest of the world and we had, for example, in Penang, Citibank setting up their Asia-Pacific uh, uh, outsourcing, uh, what do we call this, um, real-time uh, documents clear uh, clearing services uh, in Penang. And it, it is servicing all the documentation online of exports uh, and trade uh, for even America, Asia Pacific, you name it, you know how many countries there are. So that's a kind of thing, probably not well known, but it's happening. Uh, I don't know. There's a debate. Do we tell the world or we just get going, getting more and more people to do things like that? High end uh, outsourcing of services in Malaysia. So that's what uh, the concept of Malaysia as a hub should be. I just want to add one more thing. We have, you, you mentioned uh, as a comparison, Singapore. We have everything that Singapore has, you name it, uh, infrastructure, connectivity, legal business uh, environment. And we have what they don't have is mentioned by Dr. No, we have land, they don't have land. There's no way that they have the kind of land that we have. And that's something that, you know, that we can leverage on to position ourselves within the region. Uh, anything else Singapore has, we have. That's, that's the only thing I want to add. Um, I, I do want to say that the uh, question that is raised is very key, uh, that we need to create in Malaysia an identity of some sort, where the association, and there are many other countries and the states in the US have done it. So for example, Silicon Valley, which is Northern California, has huge agriculture sector. But it is identified by Silicon Valley because that's their identity, and they've been able to promote that very well. Uh, North Carolina uh, basically was a tobacco country, and they decided that's not the future anymore, more agricultural, and they have gone into biogenetics. San Diego is number one, California. Massachusetts, number two. But number three out of nowhere is uh, North Carolina. Winston-Salem, Atlanta, the city that I live, we are now creating a new Atlanta identity. Atlanta will become the Detroit of the automotive sector. All automobile companies are moving south in America as about 100 years ago, all the textile companies moved from New England to south for whatever reason. And it's a question of just grabbing the opportunity. It doesn't mean you have factories, but all of the automobile companies worldwide will hub their corporate headquarters there. Because it's so easy from there to manage anything by and large. And the last point you made is very key. I think uh, Malaysia has to focus more on services side. As you want to go from the current income level to the high income level, services and high end services is where you will find your identity. And I think that is where China badly needs help. Surprisingly, they are still not as good into services economy. They're gunning for it. And I think one can create that ecosystem.